Hey everybody, how's it going? This is uh, Q&A number nine. It's a beautiful day here in Florida. I'm kind of sitting out in my backyard in the in my war bonnet, uh, Blackbird, just uh, just enjoying the, the the beautiful temperatures here. I've got uh, oh I don't know five or six a handful of questions that have been asked of me. I thought I'd, uh, I'd catch everybody up on and uh, and anyway, uh, let's uh, let's go get at okay, it. Okay, so first question comes from Todd. He asks, uh, this is Todd one. Uh, do you see many hikers using the Yursac, and if so, how did that work out for them? I personally hate hanging a bear bag, and this seems like a nice alternative, even though it weighs more. Uh, in 2016, I didn't see any Yursacs at all. Uh, last year, 2000, or this year in 2017, the, the two months I was out on the trail, uh, I saw two. Um, neither of them used it in the, in the normal sense of just tying it around a tree. They both used them as uh, bags that hang up on a bear bag, uh, which I think the downside of the your sack is a it's, it weighs a lot compared to like a, you know just a Z packs uh, Cuban fiber that's also very rodent resistant. Um, it doesn't close super tight at the top, so theoretically it could fill up with with rainwater. So you pretty much would maybe want to use a sack inside of it. Um, they don't they don't qualify as a bear as a bear canister in places that require a bear canister so um i think they're i think they're a pretty neat concept with that kevlar um and you know in the end a bear bag is you, you bear bag to protect the bear because once a bear gets human food it's like cocaine and they can't they can't not go after it and it usually results in the bear losing his life so um, I mean, we can all survive by losing some food. We just get off the trail and go into town and get some more. But uh, to bear that could end their life. So that's why you, that's why you kind of hang. Most of your issues on the AT, honestly, are from rodents. And so, um, so we usually throw things up to make it hard for the rodents to get to it. Your sack, definitely not going to have any rodent problems. You just have, it's just more weight to deal with. So uh, I think not a bad option. Just uh, if you're going to be weight conscious, uh, something to think about. All right, uh, now we had made a comment last time about, there was a question about when to start uh, maybe switching over from boots to, um, to trail runners. And I talked about for myself, maybe past uh, a lot sooner this time, maybe past the Smokies. Um, early riser this year, now he started out in, in boots and then he swept, swapped to trail runners. And he has, a, he has a comment here that I think is worth, uh, worth mentioning to everybody. He says, a worthwhile option for those using trail runners in February and March will be to buy a good pair of Gore-Tex socks. Uh, one of my subs suggested it to me later on in the trail and I bought a pair. Uh, really liked the combo and my feet did not sweat near as much as I thought. And this was in May. Um, if I did it again, I would start in trail runners this time and have a pair of Gore-Tex socks available if confronted with the type of cold and snow that Kansas and I faced uh, after we left Damascus. And, uh, and once again, Kansas told me that you know, he'd gotten some uh, some frostbite during that period of time in that, that big snowstorm, which is also why you keep your gear, your cold weather gear, until you're at least um, to Parisburg. Okay, so you can, you, st you still want to keep it um, when you leave Damascus. Don't uh, don't get caught up in the in the euphoria of all oh, the weather is great. Let's send it off because you still got some high elevation to go through, and uh, and until probably until probably mid-April, you can have at least one more Arctic Clipper that kind of comes down and hits hits further south. All right, uh, Gary Tooney Daly. Now, I, I met Gary. He and I got the hike a little bit together through Punch Bowl, and we were gonna go up to at least Waynesboro together. Um, he had, had ended up having to get off for some medical issues a little bit sooner than that, but we did get to, to, to hike a little bit last year together, so shout out to Gary. He says, um, hey, I'm going to be starting in, in March the 24th of 2020. Uh, I know a while away. Question number one, how cool or cold is it that time of year? Um, since he's always been kind of a June hiker, he's a school teacher, so he you know, finishes school and goes out and hikes. Um, I don't think it's that, that bad that time of year. I, I started out on the 3rd of March. We had a snowstorm. We had some really cold weather around Franklin, so that would have been mid-March. I started up uh, into the Smokies just after my birthday, so towards the end of March. The Smokies, they went down pretty cold, down to about 22 degrees a couple of nights there. That was, that was pretty cold, and after that, the cold really never bothered me after that. Um, 
So uh, if you're starting out on the 24th of March, you know, even though you know you got some high elevation there through the Carolinas, um, I think you can still have one or two Arctic clippers that could come down. You know, be prepared for um, you know mid 20s maybe would be a good rule of thumb, and and three layers is really all you need. Uh, a base shirt, something long sleeve like a uh, like a Patagonia uh, quarter zip and then use your, your raincoat as a, as, a, as, a, as a wind barrier, cold barrier, if you will. And uh, that'll, that'll, that'll keep you warm enough until you start hiking and then you start shedding clothes. When you really, when you start hiking, uh, your temperature goes up and you can really, really um, decrease the amount of, uh, of layers that you've got. I almost always hiked in no more than two layers. And eventually, even though no matter what the temperature was, I usually could get down to my one my one base layer, which was just a short sleeve smart wool t-shirt. And as long as you kept going, then if I would stop, I would grab my, uh, my uh, mountain hardware uh, kind of rain jacket and throw it on as, as a kind of a vapor barrier, if you will. And that would keep the, the warmth in while I ate my lunch or took my break and I could take it off and be a little cold when you start out, but it doesn't take long to warm up. Um, did you ever go cookless and in what section? Gary, I never went cookless. Um, um, and I'm not sure how I would do trying to rehydrate like ramen noodles and, and uh, pasta sides in cold water all day and then, and then really feel like eating those at the end. Um, maybe once you get really, really hungry, you would um, because you, you're fighting the desire not to eat anyway when you first start out. Um, if I were to go cookless, probably most likely it would be I would eat eat what I do for lunch, which brings up the next question um, um, that somebody else asked me, I'm going to kind of insert it here once before, is is kind of what, what are those lunches that you like, you know, and 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 I really like the uh, like the Genoa salami and cheese. I like a lot of protein at lunchtime. I always struggle with, uh, with peanut butter. I never, it took me a long time to finally start hiking with peanut butter. It wasn't until I really had lost a lot of weight. And then I was really kind of in that. Okay, I gotta, I gotta preserve some muscle mass here, and uh, I, I forced myself to, to eat the peanut butter. I never really did like the tortillas. Um, I like tortillas normally, but I, on the trail I just never liked them. They seem so heavy. I really, I really like those little sandwich thins, uh, those little round. You know, they're about, um, oh, they're about that big, and they're thin, and so they're already kind of smashed, and they're they're kind of pre-cut, and and you know some. Um, you can use some peanut butter with those. I like to take a couple pieces of cheese and, and buy those, uh, those tuna fish packets that already have the mayonnaise in them and, and put that in there and uh, um, that makes a great lunch. Okay, um, So I, I tend to eat a lot of, try to eat a lot of protein at lunchtime. So if I were to go cold cooking, I would probably just repeat that and do that at dinner time again. Um, you know, eat, eat some, some protein like that and some cheese and you know, some peanut butter, some sa sandwich, some sandwich type bread, uh, power bars. You know, the anything that's got uh, you know um, some 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 good protein in it, as well as some carbs and some energy bars, maybe things like that. But I really tend to like to have a hot meal, even if it's hot in the summertime. I tend to, and and 2016 when 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 you met me. I was kind of just to the point of in the evening just eating mashed potatoes with some with something mixed with it. I just um, because they were it was a comfort food. It tasted good. It filled me up. My body wanted the potassium that was in the in the potatoes. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. You also ask uh, how did you cope with your pace compared to others? That was psychologically the hardest thing to deal with. Um, at first, I was really, it really was discouraging that uh, everybody kept coming by, but it's okay because I told myself I was, was going to have to get in shape on the trail. I, I didn't have the ability to, to really get out and do very much before I went out to hike, and, uh, and so I knew I was going to have to deal with that, but it was still psychologically hard. Uh, and then eventually, um, I would joke about it, uh, saying that people are going to choose my, my, my trail name was going to be Come On By, because that's what I was always saying to people. Um, and then I, I kind of came to a realization after I was getting in shape and losing weight that I still couldn't go any faster and did some research into heart medicine that I was taking 
and that's when I realized that um, it was acting like a governor and my heart was only going to be able to go so fast which meant I was only going to get so much oxygenation to the muscles and there's, there was only a certain, a, so much of a speed I could go. There's no way I was going to ever be able to do more than two miles an hour. Just That just wasn't what was uh, available to me to do. Um, so I, I guess understanding that constraint was very helpful. And question number four, what was your favorite lunch or food to eat? Um, once again, I think I just answered that uh, a little bit ago. So, All right, um, Ed Millington says, hey, Big Bird, um, now you switched from, from hanging a hammock to a ground sleeping. And uh, if you've covered the reasons why in previous videos, please direct me to it. Uh, I have, but what's ironic is I was going to talk about that just a little bit because I've been watching... Uh, Amanda Bess, um, Ernie Reiser mentioned that she was um, um, going to be video vlogging her, her hike in 2018. So I was watching some of her prep videos and, and it was kind of reminding me a lot of the same of the stuff, the things that I was thinking and doing as I was getting ready to go out. And she's going through that, do I hammock or do I not hammock right now? Because we all say we get better sleep when we hammock, uh, but it also kind of depends on the cold butt syndrome and how well you are able to keep yourself insulated on the bottom side, whether you, whether you actually sleep that well or not. Um, I started out in a hammock, and and when I got to Neil's Gap, um, I had a, kind of a crisis to have to, to handle, in that I had too much weight and too much bulk in my pack. I was having to, I was, I was taking me hours to get out of camp because I had a micro pack in my pack because uh, I, I couldn't get everything in it because I was, I was using, well, I was using a um, uh, my Blackbird. Okay, the, the hammock was the black bird from uh, Warbonnet, and I was using also the Warbonnet the Super Shelter. Um, you know, so those two together um, actually had a little bit of weight to them. And then uh, I had my top quilt and I had my under quilt. My under quilt was a, a Jacks or Better 20 degree full length. So that was like carrying a second sleeping bag. So in a way I had two sleeping bags in my pack, okay, and the heavier tarp and tent setup. And and that was honestly, um, it was it was heavy and it was bulky. And when I got to Neil's Gap, if I was going to continue on, I had to do something. And so I chose to go to the ground. Um, I already had the the Neo Air because I knew I'd have to be in the ground sometime during in the shelters and things. So I already had the air mattress with me. Um, in at Waynesboro, I went back to my hammock because now it was full blown summertime. I wanted to be able to you know get out of the sweltering tent. Um, didn't have an under quilt, but I did have a kind of a, a poncho liner, and that wasn't quite enough. So I tried my my Neo Air in my hammock, and that air mattress it liked to flip and slide around. Even though I have two layers to put it in between, it would move and I would get cold, and so I was still struggling with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if I were to hammock again, um, I would probably still start out on the ground if I started out in February or March I would start out on the ground okay and then maybe once I got through the Smokies graduate to the hammock and a 40 like a 40 degree three-quarter under quilt because the one I've got well I can compress it up into a ball about this big now okay and so really that's that would go in the compression sack with my top quilt so as far as volume wise it wouldn't be that much volume I think it would do better and I would get a uh, I would do a cube and tarp uh, um, a Cuban fiber for a tarp, okay, and go lighter. Um, it just, and I think that would be the way to hammock. Um, it's just that you know, on a long distance hike, it's just every little ounce and uh, and pack volume just adds up, okay, and kind of wears you down if you're constantly carrying it. So, um, when I start back out in April in the north. Um, either April or May when I get back up to New York and head north again, um, I will probably start out with a tent for at least a month or two, and then I might graduate to hammock to finish it all up, okay? So um, now uh, that's the end of all the questions that, that have come in. I was I was watching uh, another, another uh, I think it was a YouTuber, um, I think it was Darwin, and uh, one of his, one of his um, um, s subscribers asked about, hey, how long does a canister last? And uh, um, let me go grab my stove and a, a, a canister 
And let me give you my perspective on this real fast, okay? Okay, this ridge line kind of keeps messing with me a little bit, but uh, so um, when, I, when I went from my alcohol stove to the canister stove, I did so because I was having a hard time having a kind of a consistent burn with the alcohol stove. The one I had picked out that I ever knew was, it was kind of a fuel hog. Wasn't carrying enough fuel with me. Uh, I was always seeming to, it, was seem, it seemed like it was burning more than what I'd planned for. And um, it, the colder it got, the worse it, the worse it functioned. So I was, I kind of, I, I got frustrated with, you know, people would come in and they'd turn their jet boils on and their pocket rockets and they'd be done eating by the time my water ever boiled in my alcohol stove. So, so at uh, Hiawassee, I, I went into the little outfitter there by the, uh, um, by the budget inn and, and picked up a, a pocket rocket and a little, little canister stove. A little canister of fuel here. This is a 3.9 ounce or net, 110 grams net. Gross weight 7.4 ounces. Um, and um, I asked the guy, how long would this last? <laughs> that's whatever. That's the question we're working on, right? Well, how long does this last? And he goes, oh, about 10. You can, you can, about 10 times heating two cups of water up to boiling. And uh, you know, 110 grams. That that was probably that's probably pretty close. Pretty pretty close. Okay. Well. Well, how do you know for sure? So what happens if I switch over to one of the bigger ones? That's the uh, the 227 gram uh, net. Um, how does how you know how much how long is that going to last? Well, um, it there's a, a, there's it depends, and there's some variables. Um, for example, your water temperature that you start with. Um, if you've been hiking all day and you're out of water and you go down to the spring and you bring the cold water back. Okay, it's going to take longer to heat it up to boil than if you still had water left over and you use, use that first because it's now heated up to the ambient temperature of 60, 70 degrees. Okay, so your water temperature um, is a factor. Um, your the altitude, okay, water boils at, uh, at a lower temperature if the higher, the higher you go, um, for example, and uh, which, makes, which means you have to cook longer. Okay, so if you're actually cooking at altitude, you have to cook longer because your temperature is actually lower at where it's boiling. Okay, um, your stove type. Um, I've got I've got three stoves. My uh, my pocket rocket. I, I've done a little test on it. My pocket rocket burns um, for me and my style. And I'll get to, I'll get to your 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 cooking style here in a second. Um, but but for me to boil two cups of water. Um, the pocket rocket takes eight grams. The BRS, excuse me, seven grams. The BRS 3000 titanium stove that I used for, for the two months this year uh, is eight grams. And then I've got a Soto that uh, is the favorite stove that Will Wood, uh, Redbeard, likes to use. I haven't used it out on the trail yet, but I've done my test with it. it it'll, it'll, it'll do uh, uh, two cups in with five grams of fuel. Okay, so, so a significant difference. Um, let's see, um, and, uh, and, and, and your personal style. Well, what is that personal style? What does that mean? Uh, first one is flame management. So let's say you've got your, you got your stove, and I'll pull out my pocket rocket here since it's the, the largest of the stoves to actually uh, to uh, demonstrate with here. And uh, let's say, where's my GSI here? Okay, so... You know, if you if you turn this thing on full blast, okay, so it sounds like a rocket, okay, pocket rocket, okay, it'll boil water really fast. Well, I, I would argue, who cares? If it's the end of the day and you're all sitting around talking, who cares if your water boils in two minutes or five minutes, as long as it gets hot. But if you use twice as much gas, getting it, it hot three minutes sooner, well, now you're going to be swapping out canisters more often okay okay so so you know your 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 boil style here is uh, I'll call it flame management you know if 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 your flame is coming out and leaping and licking up the sides of the of the pot you're wasting all that fuel for the most part yeah it's it is transferring a little bit to the inside here okay and heating things up but uh, so so flame management how do you how do you and, and you got to be consistent okay me personally, I will adjust the flame so it's heating just the bottom with not a lot coming up the sides. Okay, that that to me seemed to be very fuel efficient, 
And in fact, um, I, I, I could get about 15 uses out of that small, that small uh, bottle doing that, okay? Um, wind management, okay? Are you sitting this thing out on the picnic table and the wind's blowing and you've got it on a full blast? Or you might have it, you might have it cranked down to almost a simmer, but all the heat's getting blown out. So where's your wind? Are you managing it? Do you have some, do you have some uh, um, food bags that you've put up um, along the side? Uh, are you down near the, the, the fire pit where you've got some rocks that are, are around to kind of act as a windbreak, okay? So that, that flame management, that wind management comes into this. And then boil management, okay? Do you, do you, um, do you let it come to a rolling boil? Or do you um, let the bubbles start to form on the bottom? The temperature difference between the, the, when the bubbles start to form on the bottom and just starts to boil to a rolling boil is not that much temperature difference. So you can actually save some fuel by, by watching you know, your pot. And when, the, when it starts, when the, boil start, when the bubbles start to form on the bottom and start to rise, that's good enough, especially if you're freezer bag cooking, your mountain house meal cooking, um, you're going to use a pot cozy cooking, okay? All of those are, are, um, are I, I call all of them freezer bag cooking, okay? It, it's, it's having some sort of, you know, some sort of a, 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 an insulator, if you will, okay? It can be a pot, it can be an envelope, whatever, whatever it is, you're, you're going to basically just heat the water up. Now, with this GSI, I often, if I was like cooking something other than potatoes, I would put it in here, so it would heat up with that food in there, so it would get a, a start on its rehydration. And as soon as it barely start to boil, I put it in here. Okay, and if it said to cook something, boil something for seven minutes, I'd double that and let it sit for 15, and it always seemed to work out. Okay, um, so and the other thing is, do you know, do you use a lid or not? If you use a lid, it'll cut down on the, on the boil time. And and the last thing that uh, that uh, I think it was pat, Sir Pax a lot in Hiawassee at the top of Georgia said, um, you know, you're going to use a lot more fuel if you're all sitting around talking and you look over and your water's just boiling away. Okay, if you pay, if you pay attention when you're, actually, when you're actually heating up your water and, and get to that point where it just starts to boil and you cut it off, you know, you could get another meal or two out of a, a canister of fuel. So if you really want to know how, how, how long, how, much, how long a fuel canister would last before you go out on your hike, Okay, I think it's very simple. You take your stove, you get some cool water, about 55 degrees, because that's what you're going to be mostly is going to be coming out of the streams. Okay, you're going to be using that. You take some 55 degree water, put two cups in whatever pot you're going to be using, and and you know put this on a scale. Obviously, you're going to take this off. So put this on a scale, set it on grams, because that's going to be the most precise measurement. Okay, and and weigh it. Okay. And then hook your stove up, um, whatever flame you like to use, whether you like to have it on full blast or you like to, 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 to manage the flame, set it where you think it's going to work out well for you and, and bring it up and, tie, and, 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 and bring it to a boil. You can time it if you want, but, uh, but as, soon as, it, as soon as it starts to boil like you like it, whether that's a rolling raging boil or just a bubbles forming, then cut it off, take your stove off, okay, and uh, go put it back on the, on the, on the, uh, on your scale and find out what your consumption was okay and uh, it let's say the consumption is 10 okay so this fuel canister is 110 grams do the math 10 into 110 is 11 times so this will last for 11 11 times I can heat water up if you're going if you like to um, cook to uh, actually cook in your pot okay well then do the same thing weigh it Hook your stove up, cook your meal, turn it off, see how much, see what the weight of the uh, the fuel bottle is, do the math. Okay, it might be if you like to cook with this, it may only be three or four uses. So it depends on once again, it depends on on you and your style, but you can figure it out. And uh, same thing with the big one, 227 was 227 grams. If it's 10 grams per per uh, per boil. I've got uh, you know 22, 23 meals, okay, um, and that and that tracks. I actually a lot a lot better than that. I had uh, that, that large, uh, a large fuel canister, and and half of one of these uh, uh, lasted me for. 
what, two months? Yeah, yeah, two months. So now, I mean, you've got times where you're eating meals in town and stuff, so it's not, that's not an everyday thing, but uh, it, it'll last, it they last a long time. All right, I hope this helps. Um, anyway, uh, not, uh, not, to, not this is not meant to step on Darwin's answer, but it got me thinking, and, uh, and I thought I would share that with you, that uh, there is a way to figure it out, but it's gonna be individual. There's no one pat answer for anybody. All right, until next time, hike on.